Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. What studies have been done uh, on performance now? Looking at that, do we have? Can we can we look at numbers on different types of whether it's in just power athletes and exogenous ketones and do we see do we see an actual benefit in both? fat adapted in the standard high carb athlete, if there's a difference. Yeah. So to answer that last part first, unfortunately there are yet as yet no studies published. Um, I think there's one in publication, but no studies published looking at exogenous ketones in the high fat athletes. So pretty much all of the studies are done in athletes on normal Western higher carbohydrate diets. Um, and then you, you could sort of divide the studies into a couple of buckets, those with esters and, and those with salts. Broadly speaking, those with salts have shown like null effect on performance, um, which, you know, a lot of the performance tests that are used are quite short. Um, I'm try- I don't think there's anything longer than 15 minutes been done with a salt. And actually, I'm not necessarily that surprised that they're not helping with the shorter, shorter uh, duration performance, I'd expect. Um, <clears throat> them to be more effective for for longer bouts of exercise. So uh, maybe maybe four or five, six studies using salts. No, nothing conclusive coming out there. Um, partly maybe because of study design. And then esters. Um, one different. There's two different types of ketone ester. Um, one of the types has been only been studied one time, and unfortunately, it was really badly tolerated. And all of the athletes were like nauseous and sick and all of that, and so it didn't help with performance in that category um that test that was done the other ketone ester is the one that i worked on in my time in oxford um, that's called a bhb mono ester and that ester has been studied in like three or four performance studies the one that we ran over at oxford showed a two percent improvement in performance of 30 minute time trial cycling um, but that's not yet been replicated outside of oxford so there was a null effect on a 10 kilometer time trial um, and then there was also a protocol that used intermittent running with like a soccer player population. And there was um, no, no, again, no decrease in performance, but no obvious benefit to that sprint performance. So again, you know, maybe, maybe that would not be that surprising. One thing that was interesting that came out of that study, though, was that cognitive performance was preserved throughout the, um, throughout the exercise test with the ketone and not with the uh, control carbohydrate condition. And so, you know, I kind of look at this as we're really the very beginning of this field and um, performance, especially in something like a team sport, it's kind of a holistic combination of the cognitive performance and the physical endurance, but also sprint performance. There's so many different parameters that go into that, that um, it's quite possible that over a game or over a season, for example, in basketball, where they're playing a number of games over the whole season in the NBA in very close succession, <clears throat> that um, maybe there'd be a, a improvement over the whole season. One uh, area that, again, is very, very early, but very promising is the use of ketones post-exercise for recovery. Um, and there was a very interesting study that came out of a university in Belgium where they did a three-week overload uh, protocol with some you know, moderately trained students, and they really like whacked up their training volume and broke them. And they were looking at the hormonal and uh, physiological markers during training. And um, in the control group, everything sort of started to deteriorate. They couldn't get their maximum heart rate so high. They were secreting cortisol and stress hormones. And a lot of that was um, mitigated by having ketone esters post-exercise. So you know, to go back to the comment that I made about it being a new food group, a new macronutrient group, we spent a lot of time dialing up like pre and post exercise carbs and pre exercise protein. No post exercise protein. Yes. You know, or BCAAs, all of these little nuances around like when to use different things. So I suspect that there will be niche roles for exogenous ketones in different sports, both pre and post exercise. Yeah, that's really interesting because I was going to ask about that, like where we were at from the recovery standpoint versus the performance standpoint. I've been, uh, I've been working with uh, this company S Fuels for a, for a while now this year, and they are, they work with uh, Dr. Dan Plews, who's kind of in the, yeah. the periodized carbohydrate, uh, low carb, high fat kind of like world of research, and and I, they were mentioning that with uh, exogenous ketones, you know, the most promising spot from just something to bring to market at the point is likely in the recovery world right now in terms of being able to back it up with any significant amount of amount of research. And 
that 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 makes it way more intriguing i think in the sense that when you watch some of the pro sports that have been trying to utilize that because uh, i think it, it often gets confused like i think the most obvious would be like the tour de france that started yeah. and they they oftentimes pioneer a lot of the stuff where they're trying to stay a bit ahead of the science but like you know, if you look at it like, oh, they're taking exogenous ketones, maybe maybe there's something to it from a performance standpoint. But for an event like that, it's more like who can recover better as much as yeah. it is who can be really great on any one day. So yeah. perhaps they're not as far ahead as one would think. They're just kind of targeting what is more proven than anything else at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think the what's interesting is the research group that um, published that really interesting recovery paper. It was actually headed up by one of the, um, one of the sort of lead physiologists for one of the cycling teams. So I suspect that he's taking back into the lab, something that he's been doing in practice in training and in racing with the team. Um, and certainly speaking to, to those teams in my, in my old, with, when I was with HVMN, the company that was supplying a number of the teams um, and speaking to the researchers doing that, I think that for them, it's like, yes, because I mean, and it's really interesting. So ketones can help with oxidative stress and inflammation and with potentially with glycogen repletion and potentially with maintaining a sort of a, less of a catabolic state that can get induced by these very repeated intense day after day after day efforts. So, um, yeah, like scientifically and mechanistically, there's a lot there that makes sense. You know, we are, there's also a lot that makes sense with the performance stuff, but it's not been sort of, especially having been an elite athlete myself, right? I think about how I thought about um, my world championship final and, you know, the biggest pieces that went into that puzzle were the quality of the training I could do in the run up to the event, the, um, the quality of the sleep and the nutrition and hydration in the days before the event, and then supplements on the day of the event. That's really, to me, it was just really small pieces, you know, even just the quality of my warm up, and, you know, the, I would, we would do hormonal priming, so like medicine ball slams to maintain our cortisol. You know, we do lots of little things. And so for me, the add value add of any one supplement on top of that would have to be, it would have to be really, I'd have to feel really confident about it knowing that it would make a really big difference to to be even using that because by that point when you're super elite you kind of you do, you put the, everything in place so that you can just go out and execute and um as far as sport performance goes in, in the olympic distance events most of them the most evidence-based things are caffeine nitrates beta alanine creatine um and have i said everything I might have missed something. Did I say nitrates? Caffeine? I think so, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's three or four, four, four or five things that are recommended and that are suitably backed by evidence. Um, I think it'll take a while, and I'm not super confident that ketones would ever get to that point where it would make that list of something where it's like, yeah, the, all of the evidence for most people stacks up that you should always be using this. And the other kind of consideration as well is just sort of, um, practicality because at the moment exogenous ketones are pretty expensive and hard to come by um, you know and I think for me would I spend $30 maybe if it was my world championship final but you know it's there's a bit of friction to, to that and also they taste pretty bad we're working on it but they do taste pretty bad as well so it's not not necessarily the easiest thing to just implement Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. 